Okay, welcome to this episode of Supercharge. My name is Fredrik Selander. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of SuperOffice, and I will be your host today. Today's topic is back to basics in sales and marketing. And our special guest is Carl Carell, Chief Revenue Officer and Co-Founder at GetAccept. With the current economic climate, we know a lot of revenue leaders are getting pushed to achieve more with less resources. In the coming 30 minutes, uh, we will share our hands-on advice on how you can get more bang for the buck. Stay tuned. If you have any questions during the talk, please use the chat and we will try to answer as uh, good as we can. And, but before we dive into the questions and the talking points, um, I want to introduce SuperOffice and then I will let Carl introduce himself and get accept briefly. So SuperOffice, we are a European CRM company founded in Norway in 1990. And we, we help primarily established mid-sized B2B companies to achieve profitable growth by being better at attracting, growing and retaining their customers. And we're especially strong in supporting companies who do have an existing base of customers and relationships, business, relationship, business relationships that they deeply want to take care of and nurture. I joined SuperOffice one and a half years ago and spending approximately a decade in the SaaS marketing uh, area. Before that, I worked in sales for a couple of years. And I must say, I love to be in this intersection between sales and marketing. I think this will be super for today's uh, session. Carl, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, yep. get that set? Definitely, Frederick. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. I think it's a fantastic topic. It's always great to when you actually have marketing and uh, yeah, revenue leaders gather together talking about the entire funnel and the entire cycle. But yeah, quickly, as, uh, my name is Carl Carell. Uh, I am CRO and co-founder, one of four co-founders of GetAccept. We've been around for seven years, started as a as a startup in Silicon Valley, uh, first office in my second bedroom, and we've grown from uh, from zero dollars to uh, to tens of millions of dollars in ARR and over 200 people with offices in seven different countries. And uh, you may ask yourself, okay, then what does get accepted? To? We we partner, of course, with fantastic companies like uh, SuperOffice when it comes to CRM, but. We are a digital sales room platform, and, and this is a new software category that we are the founders of, which essentially is how do you create the best selling and buying experience from when you've spent all those hard-earned sales development money, marketing money, so opportunity, all the way to close and ensuring that you have one Microsoft, one link that lives on through that entire journey to ensure, for example, that you have things like meeting agendas, recording, sales decks, all your content, all the way through CPQ and e-signatures, perfectly synced with your CRM to ensure that you can run a smooth uh, closing process or account executive process for your quota carrying reps. So that's a little bit about, about our uh, platform, uh, about myself. I'm, I'm Swedish, native Swedish, but spent 10 years abroad, uh, gone to business school in the US, uh, spent a, a lot of years in Silicon Valley. So uh, I think I'm a little bit uh, different in the sense from when I've now moved back to, uh, to Sweden and, and running the business from here. Uh, stumble upon some cultural differences from working in South America and North America for, for many years. But uh, very excited here to take a little bit more of a global standpoint. How you can push your organization to, to get more uh, and do more with less, which I think is a fantastic subject for today's uh, current situation. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, truly sounds exciting. And now uh, I know you are also in, you're in Spain at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, taking some time, uh, actually on, on vacation, but took some time to record a, a, a great webinar with you. So in Barcelona, I enjoy uh, being on my uh, bicycle uh, when I have time off. So uh, uh, when I do have the chance, you find me probably in some mountain suffering, trying to get up a hill. So yeah, that's <laughs> what I tend to do when I have time off. Oh, wonderful. And yeah, and, and I'm in Stockholm in our uh, office here. So uh, great to have you all here. Um, Thanks, Carl. Uh, let's jump over to the talking points. Uh, and to get started, we, we start in the new economic reality. I mean, we all know that we are facing a new, yeah, a new economic reality. And what does this mean? And why do you think we need to refocus and rethink the way we work with sales and marketing, Carl? 
Yeah, I think that's a, a great question because I think anyone who's joining this webinar is obviously thinking uh, and, and saw the tagline there, okay, how can we do more with less? And I think uh, you can view it from two different half glass, uh, half full, half empty uh, perspective. I'm a half glass full kind of person. As an entrepreneur, I think you have to uh, be half glass full uh, type of person. Uh, I actually think that positive situation here but what you need to really do is, is start to think about your organization and effectiveness and of course productivity and profitability into your entire revenue motion and I we've afforded a bit in the in the previous economic climate that there were an abundance and access to capital it was it was easier to grow you could spend more to get uh, get dollars today you need to be more cash efficient and I think there's a couple of things that that I'm hoping we're deep diving in today one part is, of course, like how do you refocus and, and focus on the right type of ICP, for example? What has, what has changed with your target market? How has the economic climate impacted them? Uh, because that, that ultimately, of course, impacts you. So what's the profitability into your, your business models? Uh, so I think one thing that I kept in mind during this time is, and I've learned also from a long time in Silicon Valley, is cut quickly. Understand your go and go criteria. The other thing that I think is a big challenge, and now I'm speaking more from a sales organizational perspective and your reps, is how do you re-educate then your sales organization and build a sales enablement motion with coaching that actually then can win deals in that new refocused ICP? Because when you're changing, don't think for a second that the entire organization just will automatically follow because you changed the strategy on how you refocus. So I think they have to go kind of in tandem uh, when you're focusing on this this new setup or, or, or changes to your organization that you need to do. But again, I think uh, uh, the, the good thing is that great organizations, great individuals, great leaders are not shaped when you, when you have tailwind. Great people are shaped uh, when you're in headwind. That's when you have the opportunity to strike against your competitors. So I think it's really important to rile your organization up and have that common goal or common enemy that we will come out strong out of this. So when things change, we can actually uh, continue to accelerate in a repeatable sales motion. So that's a little bit how I view the current setup. But of course, we all have different, different, uh, different challenges in your business. And hopefully you can get something out of this conversation that you know, one or two golden nuggets. Hey, this applies to me as well. I can try this as my organization today. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what, do we need to do different? Is it? Um, could you give us some um, some examples or like what strategies do we need to employ on a, on, a, on a high level? Yep. Where do no, we start? I, I, I think an easy way to start, uh, which then trickles down, and I think this is probably information. When I speak to our CMO uh, on our end, for example, is understanding the win loss strategy over the past recent couple of months. So I think an easy way to start is. Uh, making sure that you understand, okay, why are we winning deals today in the current economic mm -hmm. climate and why are we losing deals? And then based on that data, what then is, do you have a trend? I studied the statistics, so I love trends and numbers uh, in that, uh, from, from college. So when you have that understanding, then we can start to have a conversation. You're a marketing leader. So if we start to sit down and, and then have a chat about, okay, where are we spending our hard-earned marketing uh, dollars, for example, or euros or kronas or whatever it is? Uh, what are we generating? How mm. is that impacting the sales organization? And how is, how is our product impacting our customers today? Have that changed? And then start to reiterate on how you're doing that across the entire funnel. I think that's an easy way to start and start mm. to gather information and then be very, very clear with understanding, okay, what is success? What is no success? So you understand that the cut quickly or no go or go criteria. But mm. I think, I don't know, from your perspective, uh, uh, Frederick, I'm assuming this is a challenge, obviously, that you're seeing from marketing, you're getting more pressure. What do we get out of our marketing dollars? I'm assuming you're feeling the same same pressure to make mm. sure that you maximize the, the bucket of cash that you have available to do your efforts. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, and I think it's good to start with, uh, should I say the finish line so i mean we obviously want to generate more revenue for the company and um, looking backwards and see what, what uh, was the source of the deals for example what was it campaigns or was it inbound outbound and and 
of course, what kind of product or I mean, product here, you, you, you can go quite deep into this, um, look, looking at a lot of numbers. But um, and, and, I, and I can elaborate a bit more on it briefly, but you, you said something that uh, caught my mind and it was uh, product, how um, if the product was used differently in this new economic reality, etc. Um, would you also in, involve product in these kind of calls? Um, I think it's extremely important. I think that's to me from learning and now I've spent so much time in Silicon Valley and seeing really, really successful companies grow from, from zero to, to hundreds of millions in ARR, for example, and understanding what it is. If you have product involved in the revenue motion, first and foremost, you will build a product that people love. That was the first thing that we learned. We went to something called Y Combinator, a startup accelerator. Their motto mm. is make things people want. Yeah, uh, and sounds easy. Able to, yeah, it's very easy. Sounds very easy, but I think it, 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 it in the end you need to talk to your customers to understand them. Another motto they sent all the time that's still ringing in my head to this day. I'm still in sales meetings every single week as a sales leader, even if we have seventy salespeople. I'm on sales calls every single week to understand. What are the customers saying? We're recording all of our calls with another software to ensure and do analysis of these things. But you really have to obsess about your customers and understand what they want, what they need, what challenges they have. And to be able to do that effectively, you need to your, your uh, product owners or service line owners to actually listen into those calls and participate. So, for example, our product managers who handle certain parts, for example, integrations like, like SuperOffice, understanding what is the super office customers talking about? Mm. What, is, what is their reality? And how is our solution for them? And how mm. do they understand it? So uh, yes, I think if, if your product department or service department, if you said in services, is not talking to your customers and understanding what they want, mm. you're not growing as effectively as you could. And you're not building the best platform or offering or service that you could. So if you're not doing that already today, that's a checkbox what you need to do immediately after this uh, webinar. Cool, thanks. And just to follow up on your question uh, regarding marketing, uh, um, it's totally true. A, a lot of, um, I guess, marketing leaders are today pressured on their budget and, and um, I'm very sure there will be a tendency to focus more on short-term plays, meaning that protecting the brand building budget will be uh, increasingly difficult. Um, I, I believe more funds will be allocated to sources where it's easy to track um, track the results and digital channels for an example. You can easily see, you know, Google ads traffic or LinkedIn traffic, or it could be, um, yeah, different digital channels are so easy to, to track. Um, might be, uh, it might, might be a problem in the future if we are, um investing less in brand building activities and activities harder to measure that that will be the biggest concern now because it's so easy to find more more money to um, as an example google ads to capture demand um but if the demand was actually created somewhere else by um recommendations or i don't know podcast or whatever it, it could be created in many areas then then it will be um, and we reduce those kind of activities there will be less demand to capture maybe in the future that might be um, a, a risk uh, but at the same time we, um, we we need to focus on the, um, the revenues and the profitability to even have the opportunity to win in the future as well so uh, balancing short and long-term um, Activities will be a challenge for many marketing leaders, I, I believe. Um, and I, I agree. You're talking about deal attribution, which I think is so extremely important when it comes to this. And, and there's two things to look at as well. Of course, you can do deal attribution like you're talking about from a marketing standpoint. How are, are we automatically tagging leads that come through our sales funnel? But the other side of the, the, which I think is extremely important, you're a CRM company. Every company should have had input fields from the, the account executives or the quota carrying rep actually input uh, um, uh, data on when they talk to the client and should be instructed to talk to the client. Where did you actually find us? Mm. Was it that podcast? Was it an event? 
was it something else that happened? We have uh, one thing that is, you know, best investment we've ever made is a $99 suit that we give to all of our employees that if you've been to an event where Get Accept has been, you've never missed us. People remember us not just because, ah, oh, you're the guys in the crazy suits. That's yeah. something we've had since day one, for example. That's $99 per, uh, per, per suit. We have hundreds of, and millions of ARR attributed to those suits probably as a single source of revenue. <laughs> Just give you an example. You can be creative with your money. You can do a lot more with less. But I, I think, the, again, going back to the win-loss analysis, if you don't understand where your revenue is coming from, and even if you have hard to di interpret direct traffic, then you have to spend more time talking mm -hmm. to them to understand them. Again, it comes back to the same thing. If you're not talking to your customers, even the ones that you do lose, then mm -hmm. who doesn't become customers, maybe it's relevant how they found you. Then it's a different question. Maybe you may be lost because your product was not good enough or you didn't solve the one, two, three core problems that they had and a competitor did that better. Maybe you shouldn't pursue that because you didn't have a good product market fit for them, for example. Mm -hmm. But I think obsessing about deal attribution is also something very important. Otherwise, uh, professionals like you and me working both ends of the funnel, uh, it's impossible for us to maximize our output when we have strategical discussions. Hey, what is actually working? Or, or are we a little bit putting our finger in the wind and hoping for the best that the wind blows in the right direction? Uh, again, I love to think about data, but you, you should not obsess on just automating everything. You can actually provide a, a, a process where you get qualitative data throughout the entire process and nurture that data into an office, in, into super office like a CRM, for example, to ensure that then you can base your decisions on a repeatable sales and, and marketing motion based on that data. Mm, mm. That's good. Um, so good insights. Start start talking to your customers, even those, those you lose, uh, and see where they are coming from. Where did they hear about us? Or where did they hear about you? Uh, it could also be added as a form field, as an example, on the website. And, and it could be for sales reps to, to, answer, to ask as well. Uh, next point. Um, so we need to get more effect with less, with less resources. And one key is then, of course, to better understand um, where revenue today are coming from, uh, what, what channels, or where to capture, capture the demand. Um, but using our resources more efficient do you have any ideas to this i mean we have a set of sales reps you have some marketing budget um any ideas here a lot of ideas i think uh, get accept was created as a business and and this is my third company i've bootstrapped two companies in the past failed with one succeeded with another i, I think having that in your dna we actually have do more with less as one of our core values in the organization so i think one way is obviously making sure that your entire organization are thinking about this i don't think great leaders should enable their organization uh, to come up with ideas, you're directing it, you're orchestrating the ideas as a leader, if mm. ideas are coming from organizations. So I think it starts a little bit, if you don't have that uh, DNA, maybe start thinking about uh, communication and stuff like that to, to get those ideas from the entire organization. It's very hard to be, do everything by yourself uh, as C-level leaders, for example, or VPs to get everything done. Um, when it comes to revenue, I think it starts to, to a, a different subject that I, I know you're very passionate about, Frederick. And I think that's how you refocus your ICP to, to put that money into a motion that actually creates more with less. And I think you, ha you have to start there. Mm. Uh, so uh, again, going back to that question, and I think you, you have a couple of points here, Frederick, around, around the ICP question that I mm. think is, is, is really insightful. Yeah, I good, good points. And uh, yeah, I, I, we will soon jump into the ICP topic and <clears throat> talking about marketing again and doing more with less. Um, I was reading a post, I think on LinkedIn the other day here, that if you have a large marketing budget, it's quite easy to hide. <laughs> you can hide behind a big marketing budget and you can be in inefficient and still generate a lot of bus or leads or revenue. Uh, but having a small budget, it's, it's actually quite good to... Um, uh, spark creativity because you need to be <laughs> creative to see okay what can i do with five thousand euro as a marketing budget i mean you can do a lot uh, I, i'm i'm very sure i mean 
you might uh, use uh, an external agency to produce a video, customer's case testimonial, but you could also do it like this, uh, like a interview series with a customer and you just record it and it's for free. And you could uh, send maybe a survey five customers and you do five testimonials uh, in, in a video podcast format and you can transcribe it into text for like zero cost. You could co-host event. We can have a partner. I mean, we can do something together. We share the cost. We get double distribution. Maybe you have a customer. I mean, those who listen might be in the manufacturing industry or, you know, in construction, whatever. And we might have a customer selling vending machines. Maybe they have a cool new fancy product they want to showcase for construction companies. And they might have a cool um, office. Hey, we can invite them to your office. We don't have to pay money for a fancy hotel. You can show off your nice coffee machines. And we can have a, um, you know, a, a leader from, a, from one of our customers as a speaker for free as well. And most likely more impactful than the, those standard conference venues with paid speakers who, who are sharing the same story over and over again. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I actually believe uh, in some cases, don't listen here, dear CFO, but sometimes a, a smaller budget is better, right? Um, because you need to be creative, but the budget is sometimes needed to um, speed things up, but also to maximize the reach with distribution. I think you're hitting on a very important po point, and that's being genuine across your messaging and your events or your communication in general. And, and I mean, that's something we're very passionate about, get accepted, is that for example, like you say, when you run an event, it's not the amount of money, many dollars or euros or, 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 or sex or nox or whatever you're spending. It, it's the people you put there and how they're engaging with the audience that you have, for example. And I agree with you, maximize your, your utilization of your office spaces and stuff like that. As I mentioned, I mentioned the suits as an example. Instead, we did that because we couldn't afford to sponsor the conferences where we knew our clients were. But we got more conversations with the people at the conferences and they remember us more than the people who spent 100 grand to sponsor that conference. Mm. Uh, and I, th I think, again, it comes, you have to have these ideas and get people excited about these things. And I think sending great people to, to events is also an easy way of hijacking something or doing something um, that, that generates more buzz than, than necessarily a, a big spend and relying on that. And, and there's many different small things. You mentioned a, a couple of great things that I think are, are, are excellent here on, on how you can how you can get that uh, get that extra juice for uh, for for the squeeze that you're doing essentially. But then having to rethink a little bit what you've done and understand uh, it. And for, it yeah. Yeah. for example, for example, you mentioned one thing that I think is, is interesting. It's events. Who like if you have your ICP dialed down, is there any events, smaller events that maybe are not high cost that you can go to and meet these people and talk to them in person, get insights to them, what they're interested in. Um, mm. I have a, a clear example of what we've done. We, we work a lot with, with partners, right? And we try to understand, we ask them, what other events do you go to? And then we try to go to those one events. We maybe send one person figuring mm. out, oh, are there a lot high density of those people here? Great then maybe we should invest in sending some more people next time. Maybe it's mm. not the sponsorship, but it's sending three people, for example, next time. And then maybe that uh, becomes a sponsorship for, for year two or year three. But those are a couple of examples where you can maximize a little bit your revenue and also explore, still continue to explore different options and do experiments on what's working for your business. Yeah. Another thing, I mean, it ties back maybe to the, to, to the suits, uh, more guerrilla marketing, guerrilla marketing activities I, I did a similar thing or not a similar thing but a guerrilla marketing activity at, at a previous employer and and um, so we were targeting HR executives and uh, we knew that in a venue in Copenhagen there will be a HR executive network so from the largest companies like Mashk and you know Fortune 500 companies and they were going to be hosting this um, network meeting in this hotel so I just called the hotel and said, hey, can we, can we have like a, 
after work lounge kind of in, in the lounge area where we we buy a lot of um, some drinks and champagne and we have some jazz so we have massage therapists and you know it costs like nothing right i had a jazz band for was it um 1000 euro max a band we paid some drinks for 1000 euro and ma massage therapists i don't know 500 euros max or something and we we had a whole lobby and it was and and, and the, the only let's say cave that was it so everyone was allowed to go there on other guests as well but we it was very visible with um for all the executives but 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 this was a low cost effort to get in front of all the people visiting this venue compared to being part of the event and paying 20 30 50k euros to be uh, a part of the event as, as a regular uh, attendee so you can do a lot of these things and i know there are some famous examples of i think it was uh, um yeah some of the our big um american uh, competitors i don't want to name them out here but uh, those big events where a lot of sales leaders are you could wrap uber taxis outside you know we have our, our owl mascot who could be there and you know dancing with the get accept suits right and and like a mascot as an example is also very strong and um, brand element that, that is very recognizable and you most likely can see example from pizza boxes to um construction trucks or whatever having clear paintings in pink or orange it's really um it, it finds its place in the in the brain of people so it's become memorable for a low cost i i personally love those types of of efforts and we have a a a, a line of them in the past that we've tried some more successful some 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 less successful and that's but it's it, it's quite fun to do these things as well and i think the one of the key things that I, I think from this discussion, when you're listening to think about it, is like get excited about doing more with less, I think is a really important thing. And, and a lot of these ideas are not coming from myself or any of my co-founders for that matter, or from our CMO. A lot of the ideas are coming from within the organization because we have asked them to be creative. We've asked mm. them to think, what must we do to get more out of these dollars, for example, what mm. can we do? And people get quite excited about these things. So posing these challenges is, is I, I think, again, if you have a really, really engaging communication towards your organization, towards your teams, you can get so much more out of them in the same way. Again, uh, getting them to, to come up with the ideas is, I, I think, really, really key uh, to ensuring that you maximize your, your budgets. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Time to talk about ICP. I see, you know, the time is uh, ticking here, but a key element in, in focusing your resources is, is being very clear between sales and marketing, also product, who is our ideal customer profile. And, and um, I mean, the whole definition of ICP is something I try to came up in my mind. It's like, imagine you only have, I don't know, 50K euro in marketing budget and you have two or three sales reps and you know you, you cannot afford not to hit your quota, what customer would you focus on? I mean, it, it has to be it has to be that. I mean, you, you're, it could be that, uh, you know, your company go bankrupt. So you have to really focus. And, and ICP is, is a narrow set of customers that greatly benefit from your product or solution. And these customers are more likely to convert into paying customers they will stay longer, so less churn. They will benefit from the features and services you have. And when I say a narrow set of customers, I mean a narrow set of your total addressable market. So, I mean, ICPs isn't just any customer who would benefit. It has to be the cream de la cream of customers for you. So as an example, we, as a CRM vendor, I mean, any company would benefit from better structure, improved sales processes, having one source of truth for everything around the customer. But it's a huge difference to serve a Fortune 500 company or a tech startup. None of them are ICP for us, but we could still sell to them. I mean, but who, who should we build features for? It could be, you know, some uh, cool, uh, I mean, a startup company might use some freemium software that they want just to quickly connect with a click. And Fortune 500 companies, they will have, you know, <laughs> 
advanced T's and C's and lawyers who need to check, double check and IT security. There will be so many things and, and integrations to SAP or something like that. Huge difference. And, and, and um, we need to really define the ICP and we need to be specific. And, and I mean, I said before that mid-sized companies in Europe might be our sweet spot, but that's not spe specific, specific enough. Um, I also said established. <clears throat> they, they, we also see the majority of our customers, they have Microsoft as opposite to Google Workspace. Uh, we support it both, but we see, see that more, more of them have the Microsoft ecosystem. They might have Visma as ERP vendor. But so, so to summarize, I mean, to define your ICP, you need to nail the firmographic criteria. That's like demographic, but for companies. So industry, size, geography, job titles, business maturity. It could also be technographic. So what kind of tech stack they're using, if they're tech savvy or um, what competences do they have internally as, as an example. And we also need to be very clear on what business problem we are solving for them. Um, so that is to very summarize ICP as I see it, where, where you have the total addressable market, your potential customers, and then you try to really narrow it down to those who really benefit. And you need to do it by much more than your size. It has to be more specific. Um, and, and so that's from me, from marketing. So call in sales, would you agree or disagree? 100% agree. I think you're bringing up some key points. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit what I can add on on, 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 on top of this. I, I, I think that number one thing is, of course, you have to set an ICP and an understanding of, of how, how many data points can be utilized to become as specific as possible. Uh, and of course, you have to think about your team size when it comes from SAP. How many people can we actually serve? How many accounts can we have on SDRs, BDRs, or if you have full cycle AEs? How are you then organizing and training them to communicate correctly? For example, if you're targeting technographics and let's say you're selling to people who actually do have Google and Microsoft, let's say you want to do that, then mm. are you specifying those teams that you have account executives and SDRs working that, that vertical? Do we have other people working the Google vertical uh, versus the Microsoft vertical? Just an example. Uh, another part of that is as well, again, I, I spoke a bit about sales enablement. Ensure that, that people understand the changes that you're making. You have to be very quick to when you explain why you're refocusing so they understand the purpose and what they need to do as, as, as ICs, individual contributors, to ensure that they're successful in that vertical. So for example, I can give you an example of what we've done. Uh, we cut one of our largest revenue streams from paid ads uh, because we knew that they're not as profitable as we want them to be. And they're creating more issues. As you said, we have higher churn on them but they're generating quite a lot of ARR for us uh, uh, on that bottom line. But it's just too costly, for example. And it's distracting our organization from focusing on what we know is uh, we actually talk about IC, ICP. Then we have something called HVC, high value customers that we're tracking as well. So a, a, a further refinement of the ICP to be really, really, really narrow where we're sending our absolutely best reps after that segment, best SDRs and BDRs, best AEs, best customer success team to onboard them, to understand them and continue to be able to duplicate that journey. And we're running several different experiments on these ICPs and HVCs to see, mm -hmm. hey, because it's not enough for us. Okay, can we generate a demand? Okay, great. They all work. But hey, we're not really good in having that initial conversation or turning them into opportunities. Okay, is there a vertical that we're turning opportunities better? Okay, great. Let's focus on that one. Then can we actually win the deal? And then continue to reiterate on this continuously. And if you're a sales leader or a revenue leader of any sort, if you are not thinking about these things, you're missing out. Because again, if you find something that's repeatable through the entire sales motion and marketing motion, then you can pour in a lot of energy to that one and actually accelerate growth quite quickly. So what mm. was the effect from, from us doing this? It, it, it hurt. It was a hurtful decision to say no to quite a lot of dollars every month. But the thing is, we saw an immediate effect within 30 days on the ACV going up immediately the first month after. Just by... Like, you mean or... Yeah, 
correct average average steel size in that segment immediately went up mm. uh, what we even did to further this to further focus is we cut commissions on that segment that we didn't want to pursue to ensure that we don't have a sales organization incentivized to actually sell and earn money on something that the business is not earning money on mm. um, again but you also changes, see that yeah. if i jump in, do you also see a higher sales velocity number since you got higher average deal size and and um... Did it also benefit the sales cycle length as well? As well? No, actually, what, what happened is we actually increased our sales cycle length, uh, but we increased our win rates. So uh, I, I don't think necessarily you have to have a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, ice in your stomach when you make changes, right? Of course, you won't see 30-day changes. We, we saw it because we were so convinced that this was the right choice when it came to that. We have then continued to see better progression in these segments, but mm. you have to really understand again the, the choices that you're making. Are they based on made on a hunch, or do you know that they're repeatable? Mm. And that's what I meant. You really have to understand entire motion. As a, we talked about product talking to your customers. Hey, can we actually build a product that we're asking for? Uh, are they asking for three things in the roadmap that we know we're not going to build within a year or two? Maybe then it's the wrong because then they will churn later down the line if you're a product company. The other side of it, again, the win-loss strategy, when we're losing deals, are we losing deals because we can uh, change something in, in, in our sales process, then we then can win them, or is it inherently something we can't solve? But I think you have to continue to ask yourself these questions along that sales cycle to analyze, hey, are the opportunities that we're feeding to our account executive and our quota carrying reps something that can be repeatable but i think i'm very passionate about sales enablement and coaching you have to ensure you can't just if you have an organization even if it's 10 20 30 50 100 sales people are you actually giving them the ammunition and the training and the coaching to be successful when you're changing don't mm. expect you as a c-level leader or vp to think that hey just because i understand it do they understand it and again it comes down to one key thing that i think is I think the most important thing for great leaders compared to mediocre leaders is their effectiveness in communication when you're making changes, when you're uh, trying to improve an organization. How do you get people to understand that? For example, mm -hmm. again, doing more with less. Are you engaging your organization to want to do that? Or are they just doing it because you're telling them to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think that comes down more to a leadership lesson than it comes down to anything else. Great, great advice. So, um, okay, we're soon, we're approaching the end of this um, talk. Um, I mean, you shared a good um, example of killing your darlings might be cutting a revenue stream to actually achieve better profitability or increase average deal size. And, and from marketing, I have to say, cutting some trade shows or physical events are usually uh, popular areas to... Um, not popular areas, but 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 efficient areas to to cut costs. Same goes with some paid. Um, often uh, Google Ads is one one area where you can where you can reduce. But but you have to be careful. I mean, it all depends. I, I I can't recommend to everyone here listening to just cut their costs here because you need to analyze what they're what what, <laughs> what are you bringing in from these channels before you do it. But you can really evaluate if these uh, activities like trade shows um, if they are bringing the value you want often you want to focus on where it's common to have expectations on leads and business opportunities reality and it's often requested by sales who want to be there because they want to meet with some potential customers uh, and uh, it's quite costly it's you know it can be 10 to 20k euros to to attend a big event and you you bring five or 10 people who spend a lot of time and there's a planning, there's swag and, you know, merch that needs to be produced. And, and um, that's one, one area. But, but beside looking at pure lead generation, it's, some, it's often covered by, okay, it's brand building. <laughs> that's, that's the usual thing. It's like, okay, we didn't get as many leads or business opportunities, but we were there. We were making a big splash, but... Then, then the question is, if, if if you really did that kind of, you created that kind of splash effect, or if you were diluted by thirty other vendors. So, <laughs> so, uh, but okay. 
So, but last last things. Um, so the last talking point is costly mistakes to avoid and maybe some share some mistakes we made ourselves. And do you have a, any mistake to share, Carl? Um, a, a, a fair few. We've <laughs> done a lot of mistakes and continue to this day. And I think it's, uh, I hate when, when people talk about their successes only. I think it's really important to share your, your mistakes. I think uh, uh, number one thing that, I, that I've learned personally is just trusting your gut feeling and, and hit the off switch when you don't believe in something and doing that quicker. I think that goes to hiring and firing goes for the same advice, right? Like if you don't believe in it, fire very, very quickly for example, but then it goes to uh, to something like events, for example. Uh, it's so easy to get in, oh, just if we generate one more client with this contract value, then we can motivate the events. I think the mistake that I, you have to make is, the mistake that you have to think about is, okay, maybe that's true, and maybe you can have a, a positive from an investment. But today, let's say you don't have more cash to spend on the next event or the next initiative, which we have done a couple of times, what's actually the alternative cost to these things? Mm. And, and one thing that, that, that you learn the hard way as well with events, if you're sending five of your best salespeople to an event that, that, that flunks, that's five of your salespeople's time for three days or four days or two days that could be spent to talking to those high value customers instead. So mm. I think that to me, the biggest mistake is just not the investment in dollars. It's the investment in time that you're spending on your organization. And mm. valuing time more than money, uh, I think, is a is a mistake that 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 uh, I I I did. I valued dollars rather than time in the beginning. So I think more about alternative cost in time is one thing. Mm. But then when it comes to to initiatives that we've done, for example, is that we've been tricked again by paid ads uh, at Get Accept that hey they are generating MQLs, but they're way too small contract values. They're still generating uh, money to the organization. But what happens then is that our customer success organization has to handle so many small accounts and, and we're not delivering the best customer experience to them. Uh, they're very price sensitive, for example. And this comes to a cost then to, again, mm. pouring that time into our high value customers instead who maybe wanted to spend $30,000 more with us, $50,000 more with us, but because we're not spending enough time with them, we're not figuring these things out because we feel obliged then to spend time across the entire revenue model, support model, customer success model, because we spent those hard-earned cash to get that revenue. So that's a costly, costly mistake that, that I don't think I or we would repeat is again, what is it actually that we bring in qualitative wise, not just in terms of dollars? How is that impacting our entire business? Like you mentioned something earlier that rang so true to me was uh, when you're sending clients into the funnel and then have products speak to them and they think, hey, these are the, the features that we need to build because these clients are screaming loud, louder than the others. But the, the wrong clients screaming on our product, building the wrong things and actually telling product managers, hey, it's okay to say this client is not important because we're not building for them. They just end up being the ones screaming the loudest. Yeah. Again, very costly mistake, but things you learn across the road. How about yourself, Frederick? So also many mistakes, of course. Uh, that's something I have to admit, and I guess everyone should admit because that's how we learn, right? Uh, but running campaigns or activities with external agencies when when you let's say both as um, the client and also the agency doesn't truly understand neither the customer or the product it, it, it's uh, you know it's like the blind leading the blind or something but because sometimes you want to just outsource a problem and say we want to drive a paid social campaign or ABM campaign or something but if you don't truly understand who you're targeting, what messaging truly resonates with the audience, it, it, it will just be painful. And, and, and there will be um, a lot of opinions and there will be missed ex expectations. Uh, and yeah, that, that's just terrible. So sometimes you need to figure it out yourself. You need to truly understand the basics we have spoke about, the, you know, the ICP, the problems we are solving for them. Um, we need to do the groundwork, um, and that's why maybe 
the, the takeaway of this session. So, you, so the, the groundwork, the basics of sales and marketing, I believe that should needs to be done internally before you can even think about outsourcing something. You need to deeply understand this. And it's it doesn't cost anything to call a customer, watch a recording, uh, and, and you can also use digital channels like this to interview ICP customers and, and you create a lot of content from it for free. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's more likely that your customer are more curious to see how, about, how their competitors are doing. Then it's like, oh, okay, your competitor is achieving, um, you know, selling 20% more by doing this tactic. Then it's like, okay, I want to see this. And in the same goes, if someone is pitching me to sell a software or something, you know, as a marketeer and I get sales leader, you get a lot of phone calls or emails. But very few truly have a, a strong pitch. Imagine if they were name, name dropping, you know, our two competitors, how they help them achieve something I truly want, maybe, you know, grow pipeline or something like that. But instead, it's like, hey, we helped um, Coca-Cola and um, Nike to, um, I don't know, grow their website traffic by 20%. I was like, okay, I, I don't care. <laughs> instead, no, no, I, instead I, 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 I think that's a great great example engaging your customer base in, in creating content i think customer proof is so powerful across the entire revenue funnel uh, in general we invest a lot in g2 crowd and case studies and ensuring getting people on video inviting them to our events because it it speaks it speaks a lot louder when somebody's actually talking about how they're using your product or your services and how that's impacting your business and, and, and something, for example, I think this webinar is an example as well. Genuine content that's non-scripted uh, and, and non-orchestrated uh, too down to the detail is generally what people want to listen to. People don't want to see yet another 20, 20 slides on, on PowerPoint or Google Slides. People want to listen to, to real content from real people talking about real problems and how they solve them. Yeah, let's hope. And um... Thank you for this session call and and uh, and uh, let's see if we have any questions in the chat and we will try to answer them and I hope uh, everyone who listened um, also appreciated this non-scripted uh, conversation with real people uh, as you can see I'm not a robot we're not generated by by AI um, but um, thank you for tuning in and thank you for uh, participating Carl thank you Frederick it was a pleasure bye bye